Um, all right, uh, I'd like to get started. Um, and I am delighted today to uh, welcome as our guest, my good friend, Hubert Murray. Hubert has worked as an architect on projects in the United Kingdom, Europe, Africa, the Middle East, and the Middle East for, and, and, <laughs> and the Middle East, as well as in the United States for the last 27 years. Since 2008, he has been working for Partners Healthcare in Boston as manager of sustainable initiatives, a program for reducing energy, materials, consumption, and waste throughout the hospital system. In this capacity, he, is, he has also been advisor to the design team for the Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital in the Charlestown Navy Yard on LEED certification and on the longer term resilience of the building in the event of climate change and sea level rise. Mr. Murray has written on sea level rise and its potential effects for Boston and has made a number of presentations on the subject and more broadly on climate adaptation in the built environment locally and nationally to architectural engineering and medical audiences. I should add, uh, along with another one of our colleagues, Antonio de Mambro, uh, Hubert Murray proposed rational, sensible solutions to our rising water situation as long ago as 1988. He is a really a forward-looking, prescient member of our design community. He was also president of the Boston Society of Architects in 2007 and is a fellow in the American Institute of Architects. Please join me in welcoming Hubert Murray. Thank you very much, George. Can everyone hear me? Well, <clears throat> thank you for fitting me in between the World Series and tricking or treating. Um, so I, I'm not, I have to sort of emphasize at the beginning, and this is really part of imagining the future, I'm not an obsessive. Um, I am not obsessed with sea level rise. I am not obsessed with climate change. Um, but I would like to think of myself, and this will sort of appear in what I have to say, as someone who has a little bit of a roving mind. I'm trained as an architect, um, but I think that one of, our, one of the possibilities of being an architect, of being a designer in any form, is to have a roving mind. So I chose this image for the, uh, for the title slide, um, for imagining the future, because we can imagine all sorts of things. We can imagine space travel, we can imagine a cyber universe, but really what we're talking about is the sum of human happiness. And here is a guy, and it doesn't have to be gender specific, um, who is fishing and watching the TV. Now this is a 1960s image of what the future could be like, pure leisure and enjoyment. So. And this is split into three stages. I'm going to talk about patterns of futures past, uh, a theory of technological rev uh, revolution and how uh, money gets involved in envisioning the future and in implementing it. And then lastly, in how one might imagine the future from today. And this um, first, this first image is actually the first almost the first image I saw at architecture school in 1969. And it was an object lesson to us. And the, I'm going to show you three examples of how the future can come at you. It can come at you from the side, as in this case. It can come at you from in front. And it can come at you from the past. So in this case, this is the Cutty Sark. It was the finest clipper ship of its time. It was the really the epitome of fine design of a ship which would sail fast to Australia, to China, and hold massive amounts of wool or tea or whatever goods it was in its hold. And it was launched in 1869. It was a superb design feat. However, what the designers and the owners had not really been looking at was seeing the future coming at them from the side which was the age of steamships, of shallow draft, and the possibility of cutting the journey time, not by just building a faster ship, but by making the Suez Canal, so that the trip to China and the trip to Austri Australia was two weeks shorter just by virtue of cutting off 
12,000 miles from the job. So the lesson there is watch for the future coming from the side, but ask what is the problem that I am trying to solve here? Is it to design a faster ship, or is it to try and shorten the journey from China to, uh, to Europe? The next example is uh, the Marconi Station, which some of you may know at, uh, Wellfleet, in Wellfleet, Massachusetts. And this is what it looked like in 1903. Um, and this was a, you know, a fantastic accomplishment. In 1903, uh, the, the president at the time, Theodore Roosevelt, um, actually had a conversation with the King of England, Edward VII, and on a very crackly line, and it was wonderful. But today, this is what Wellfleet looks like. Those have completely gone. So the future, in a happy circumstance, came at them from in front. And so that magnificent structure is completely superseded uh, by telecommunications and satellites, and even before that, what with simply having a cable under the ocean. The last of the examples is the past, which, uh, the uh, futures which can come at you from the past. And there's another object lesson in this, which is there are many pasts which can get uh, uh, synthesized into the future. And so here we have a clock, we have a letter, we have a violin, we have a camera, we have a calculator, we have a telephone, we have an iPhone. Now this is, was the future, only just a few years ago. It is now the present, and as you see, the present contains uh, many features of time past. And T.S. Eliot said it best and most elegantly, time present and time past are both perhaps present in time future, and time future contained in time past. He must have been a designer when he was thinking about that, because that is so true, and it's particularly true of our vision of the future, our vision of the future can really only be based upon our experience of the present and the past. So in <clears throat> trying to formulate a theory about this, um, I devised uh, two axes. Thinking about the sort of inventions that uh, take place as autonomous inventions. And you think principally of research scientists who are doing research in their labs, they're primarily introverts. They are just totally focused on a mathematical formula, on, or they're totally focused on a chemical uh, synthesis, or they're totally focused on, let's say, the theory of relativity. They are not looking outwards. On the other end of that axis, there are people who are out in the world looking at the way the world is going, and they're responding to circumstance. So on the one hand, you've got the introverts. On the other hand, you've got the extroverts. Then there's a cross-axis. And this is a sort of, as opposed to a technical, scientific and technical axis, this is the cultural cross-axis. There are those who are narrowly focused on technical predictions, specific predictions relating to things or techniques. The, this is the narrower focus. On the other end of the spectrum, there are those who are concerned about what the future looks like in terms of the social and cultural um, uh, things that may unfold. And it's pure conjecture, uh, it's much broader, and it's, uh, so as I say, it's a broader view. So we're gonna have a look at a, a few examples of this. But in the middle, somewhere in the middle, at that cross axis, there is a coming together of minds, of the introverted researchers, the extroverted people who have got problems to solve, the narrower focus people who are making technical predictions, and the broader folks who see what the social and cultural and political implications might be. And so that's where the breakthroughs happen and the implementation, when the coming of those sorts of minds, uh, when they come together. So, an example of technical prediction, this is on the cultural axis, is Jules Verne. And you've probably all heard of Journey to the Center of the Earth, which was published in 1864. This is in the middle of the American Civil War. 20,000 Leagues <clears throat> Under the Sea, 1869. And <clears throat> that featured a submarine going 20,000 leagues under the sea. And it wasn't a pure invention because submarines had been used in the, civil, in the American Civil War. So 
he, what he was just fantasizing about what submarines could do, what this might imply, and then a journey to the moon in 1870 in which he actually foretells uh, space travel by rocket, light-propelled spacecraft, lunar landing modules, and the sort of things that were familiar to uh, and became new things for us in the 1960s, but he was talking about it almost 100 years before. The 19th and 20th century were totally preoccupied with uh, new things. The, the period from 1895 to 1905 and then leading up to World War I was an incredibly fertile period of invention um, where you not only got the theory of relativity in 1905, you got Braque and Picasso having their cultural discussion, which we now know as cubism, the origins of cubism. We had jazz just beginning to break onto the scene. The way people looked at the world was completely different. Now, you could walk into a Paris tobacconist in the year 1900, or the period between that period that I'm talking about, up to 1910, and you could buy a packet of cigars or cigarettes, and in each one of these, you would get a, a cigarette card. Instead of a baseball player, you'd got, you get a vision of the future. Uh, which is France in the year 2000. And here I've just chosen four examples, all of which, uh, the, the common theme in these examples, which is a barber shop, a farmer, and a, um, a maid cleaning uh, the house, and, and um, a class like this, all of which have le uh, the labor-saving device most appropriate to whatever you know, the task is at hand. So clearly, labor was a major preoccupation with uh, the artist who produced all these things. There are also some fantastic things, some of which may be prescient, prescient which is there's a picture of a croquet game happening under the ocean. And in view of sea level rise, maybe this is a, a good um, foretelling of things to come. Then there's a character at another end of the social cultural axis that is the novelist and futurist H.G. Wells, who was also leading member of the Labour Party and the Fabian Society in Britain. He was a major public figure, always talking about the future. And he, you probably know, The Time Machine, The War of the Worlds, but he also wrote things like The Shape of Things to Come, and he predicted um, the, a heat ray machine, which is a bit like a taser gun uh, that we have now, uh, he predicted chain nuclear reaction when nuclear synthesis was barely a figment of the scientist's eye. He talked about uh, bioengineering, cell phones, and amazingly enough, he invented the concept of automatic sliding doors. H.G. Wells, who knew? So he's on that end of the, the spectrum of the cultural political axis, and he was predicting in, a, in an optimistic, utopian sort of way what all these machines, what all these techniques could do for us. Later on, with this social prophecy, we get less optimism and much more pessimism. And some of you may be familiar with the film Wall E, which predicts a future in which the world, or the United States, is completely covered in garbage, and it's uh, ruled by people who have grown totally overweight, and the theme is of consumerism, environmental degradation, and it has to be said, there's a sort of slight larding over with a sort of quasi-religious nostalgia of what could have been. Another example of this social prophecy, looking ahead and technical prediction, a combination of the two along that axis, is the Star Trek movie. Who, just hands up, who watches Star Trek? Yeah. You see, so people are, between your generation and my generation, there is a generation of folks in their 40s and 50s who were totally consumed with Star Trek on television. And one of the interesting aspects of Sp Star Trek is that it has a social and political agenda. And the authors of this space fantasy um, were adopted a science fiction medium in order to talk about a utopia which they believe could be brought about in America, but they couldn't talk about it in the political arena. That is, multiracialism, multiculturalism, uh, women's rights, 
sort of democratic forms within the medium of a forward-looking technology in which, you know, the universe is uh, basically the, um, the context in which all these, uh, prog this progressive social agenda is acted out. And then in the case of uh, Minority Report, we get a situation in which um, Steven Spielberg uh, looked around in all the labs across the United States, this is in 2002, um, and to find out what was going on in the research lab. So by the time the film came out, uh, it featured all sorts of things like video surveillance, very much a topic of today, um, uh, preemptive crime, which is uh, identifying someone with a computer chip, knowing that they will commit a crime and they're therefore zapping them ahead of time. You know, and we see this in drone warfare, uh, for instance. And then there are surveillance, um, surveillance ants which crawl into, the, uh, crawl into your house so that they can keep an eye on you all the time, etc. There are 13 major technologies, all of which exist today. And that's because Spielberg, in his vision of the future, looked to see what was in the present and what would be adopted as more or less normal as we see it in 2013. Now, going back to um, my diagram, there's the, the contextualists, um, the people who are responding to circumstance. And in the 19th century, we get a lot of uh, utopians that is faced with uh, in, uh, industrialization and urbanism. You've got people streaming into the cities, huge industrial cities like in, in Britain, Manchester and Liverpool, all these big, and Birmingham, and in the United States, Lowell, for instance, or New York, or um, after, in the Civil War, after Reconstruction, Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, these were all industrial things with all the ills of an industrial working class. And so what you got was someone called Charles Fourier in France saying, no, no, there's got to be a better way to live, and the way to live is this, what you see up on the screen here. And it was called a phalanstère. It was um, a carefully calculated way of ensuring that people would have a, have a happy life. So in each one of these building constructions, there were 1,620 human beings, men, women, and children, uh, there was a variety of activities for work, leisure, um, for uh, sharing, um, sharing things like laundry, you know, the things of the domestic economy like laundry and cooking and so on, and eating together. It was a very highly specific utopian community that he was imagining as a response to industrialization. In America, this got translated by Robert Owen, who was a Scotchman who came, came to America, and he built New Harmony, Indiana in 1825. And again, this was a sort of similar, highly specific, highly prescriptive uh, version of an alternative to the industrial society. And in our own, oh, in my own century, uh, and the century in which at least you were born, um, we get the Unité d'Habitation in Marseille, in France, which was the brainchild of Le Corbusier, an architect, and it is basically a direct translation, almost 100 years later, of Fourier's ideas. Corbusier had a very strong notion of what an ideal community might be in an urban context, and a lot of the ideas are, uh, are straight, you know, the provenance comes through Fourier and Owen and other utopians. And we see it in many of the housing projects of the 1950s and 1960s in New York and Chicago and elsewhere. Another response to that circumstance was, yeah, all the, the cities are all very well, but we have to have a balance between the city and the country. And so the most sort of famous name in this regard and the father of the, the so-called Garden City movement was this fellow called Ebenezer Howard. And his three magnets were the city, the country, and the ideal in between, something we now recognize as suburbia, the, where you're reasonably close to the city, but you can live in a uh, rural tranquility with all the benefits that fresh air bring to you. And that 
we know has been uh, adopted by Frank Lloyd Wright in Broadacre City and it's pervasive, for instance, in the uh, pervasive thinking in the new urbanism uh, that is sort of current in the United States. So this again, it, there is nothing new under the sun in respect of this utopianism. Then we get to the auto autonomous invention side of things and technical prediction and um, Buckminster Fuller was the uh, great inventor of uh, a previous generation and he in the 1930s was looking at mass production for ways of rethinking how we build housing. So he came up with the Dymaxion house in 1933. He had a new design for a car, the Dymaxion car, three years later in 1936. And we see you are, what is probably most familiar to all of you is the uh, spaceship Earth of 1972. Epcot was a figment of the imagination of this very technically minded engineer who had this vision of the future that it could be all lightweight skin, that everything would be done by telecommunication, that um, you know, monorail connections everywhere would do away with cars so his Dymaxion car doesn't feature anymore. But it was purely a technical view of how things could happen based on his knowledge of the technical capabilities of his present time. That is, there was no new technology involved there, but, it was, but what we see in the images is a vision of the future. But on the other hand, when you go to Disney World now, it looks like 1972. And then there was a British version of uh, Buckminster Fuller who had a social agenda as well as a technical one. And this was the architect Cedric Price, who is probably one of Britain's most famous architects. And he's only built one building, in effect, which was um, a birdcage in the London Zoo. But what he did, he was the grandfather of some of the most famous ideas in architecture in the second half of the 20th century. This first, this first image is just a, a sketch of what was called the Fun Palace. He recognized that in post-war Britain, with, just as in the United States, with uh, a widening democracy, you know, the fascist um, countries had been beaten in the Second World War, you got rising prosperity, etc., you would get a rising leisure class. So he concocted this idea of a Fun Palace, a place where everybody could come and almost anything was available. And the, the outcome of that, the fruit of that thinking, is the Centre Beaubourg in Paris, which I'll show you an image of in a second, um, and what the, what the French call a mediatheque, which is a place where you can go and learn, and it doesn't say bibliotheque, not a, not a book learning place, but a mediatheque, that is any form of media, so you can learn on the internet, you can learn through dance, you can learn through projection, you can learn through any medium you choose. And that is, the Fun Palace is the origin of that type of thinking. He was also one of the founding thinkers of the Open University, which was the first online university uh, to be uh, invented. The second thing, the, again, a sort of rather weak image, is his response to context in Britain at the time, which is the, the railways were being closed down, many of the railways. And Britain used to have a very fine network of you know, capillaries reaching almost every small village in the country and they were all being closed down, shut down. At the same time, along with this rising prosperity, and not, uh, the, the younger generation were all wanting to go to college. There was a need for the country to expand its higher education program. So what this brilliant inventor of the future did, this Cedric Price, is he united two completely separate phenomena going on at the same time and said, okay, let's start a university in the old, on the old railway tracks with the discarded railways, railroad stock and locate this right through the center of Britain where the density of population is in the Midlands, the old industrial Midlands, which was having to reinvent itself because it was you know, the British version of the Rust Belt. And he called it the Potteries Think Belt. And that was an idea which also fed into the idea of the Open University, which is a very successful institution. Now, so then, you know, again, coming down this long stream of ideas was another autonomous invention. Archigram was a famous um, 
bunch of architects in London operating in the 60s at about the same time that the Beatles were generating their music. And they're, they're a sort of a, a form of prediction inspired by Cedric Price, inspired by Buckminster Fuller, inspired by the lunar landing. Um, and here we have an image of a walking city, which is basically what we recognize today as a globalized, wired, 24-hour environment uh, envisioned in 1964. That is well over 40, almost 50 years ago. And we see that type of thing going on, not only in the cruise ships, which are now vast cities in themselves, floating cities, in which all these things can happen all at once, a bit like the Fun Palace, but also in the Fun Palace itself, which has been realized in the center of Paris in the Centre Pompidou. That same group, as well as talking about the globalized city, was also talking about the internalized, self-sufficient individual. So what we now have, you know, every one of us has one of these, and, every, and we all have one of these, a laptop, and we can be on the beach or on the mountaintop or anywhere we like, and we can be connected to our friends, to our work, and so on, and connect with world news. Now, this was a figment of the imagination in 1969, realized in uh, something called log plug, the idea of a wired uh, log in the middle of the forest, um, which would have, in effect, internet connection, where that fisherman that you saw in the first image could actually watch TV as he was fishing. That was considered fantastical at the time. And yet, here we are. We've arrived. And the same with the cushicle, which was the perfectly air-conditioned suit that you can put on. So the examples of these on these axes are, you know, as you, just to sum up very quickly, the technical predictors, you know, Jules Verne and H.G. Wells and Buckminster Fuller, the inventors don't come very much into the in illustrations that I've shown you because, you know, they are people like Copernicus, who had a new idea about how the universe worked, Lavoisier, who had a new idea about how oxygen worked, Crick and Watson, who figured out the structure of DNA, they were all operating within their labs. And on the other end of that spectrum were the people who were operating within the context of the world, and those are the utopians, the Fourier, the Owen, um, people in medicine, Lister, who invented the uh, theory of asepsis, so that you wouldn't get septicemia after an operation. And then you get the cultural predictors, uh, the social and cultural prophets, such as I've mentioned, but including people like George Orwell, who wrote 1984, Aldous Huxley, who wrote Brave New World, who were not optimistic anymore. They left the utopians behind. They saw where the future was taking us and wrote a very gloomy picture of it all. Now, okay, the second part of this, quickly, is technological revolutions. Uh, Carlotta, Carlotta Perez is an economist who has, um, who has uh, tried to formulate um, technological revolutions in terms of a, a common pattern. A common pattern, and, and she, she identifies, and this is, she's an economist, don't forget, so she's looking at it from the point of view of inv investment of financial capital in new ideas. She looks at the Industrial Revolution, steam and railways, steel, electricity, and heavy engineering, automobiles and mass production, and then the information and telecommunications thing. Now, what she says, all these, these five revolutions that ha have happened in the past 200 years, they all have in common this 20 or 30 years of gestation of a new idea, then, as we are experiencing right now, a period of collapse and readjustment, and so we, where there is overinvestment in an idea, there are some bad errors happening. There's, you know, so we don't know what is going to happen with an IPO. It may go forward or it may go bust. And we're going through the financial crisis, part of which has been those fires of the, the financial crisis have been stoked by the fact that we are totally connected in a cyber world. And then there is a 20 or 30 year period of deployment in which 
having gotten over the crisis, we see what are the stable elements of this new thinking and proceed with those. So here in sort of in a zooming in, um, we get this sort of first period which she characterizes with um, the, uh, the frenzy of innovation. We get the crisis and then we get two things. One is we continue with near-term resolutions of, let us say, the, the cybernetic revolution that we are all undergoing right now, coming through that crisis. And she suggests that there is something a little further off. There is a new paradigm, and I've put it in a smaller circle, so that we, because it's harder to find. This is what we've got to look at. It's not only the resolution of what we're, the revolution we're already in, but it's the beginnings of a thread of something new which is around the horizon, beyond the horizon. So, for example, healthcare. I'm just going to give you a quick example of healthcare. Um, the big game changers in the 19th century were uh, anesthetics, which were um, first applied at uh, Mass General Hospital in 1846. And if you can imagine what an operation was like before 1846, the best doctor was the quick doctor. That is, if your leg was being amputated, the record for a doctor was apparently in the United States 25 seconds to get your leg off. And, you know, speed was of the essence or else the patient would just die of agony. And so with anesthetics, it was just a complete turnaround. But even with anesthetics, one of the problems was that patients died just simply from the sept septicemia that followed the operation. And so Joseph Lister in Scotland uh, invented this idea of spraying carbolic acid all over the place, including the patient, and, but also the entire room, because his, his theory, his hunch was that it was something in the atmosphere that was causing this septicemia, and he was dead right, it was bacteria. Um, and so once that was under control, there was a major change. In the 20th century, the big deal was uh, penicillin. But then we come to this situation. This is where we are now. And you can read this graph very easily. Healthcare costs are going up hugely uh, in compar comparison with workers' earnings and the rate of inflation. Uh, in the United States, our uh, healthcare costs are 18% of the gross domestic product. In other advanced countries, such as France and Germany, it's around 11 and 12 percent. And even they are worried about the, slight, uh, the upward trend in their health care costs. France is the number one nation for access and quality of health care in the world. So we got a problem there. So how, and we've known this for quite some time, and the Affordable Care Act is an attempt to address this by bringing insurance premiums down. So there have been a couple of approaches to this. One is the virtualization of medical information, that is, paperless records. Um, this on the top left is what a, a, a the, the files look like in Mass General, for instance. Uh, in France, you can walk into a doctor's office, and the most amazing thing that you see is the total absence of filing cabinets. The, everything is on paper, everything is on your credit your health card, you swipe your health card when you go in, the doctor has on his screen your entire medical record, wherever you go, and you have free access anywhere in the country. Um, so this is what is happening here now, and it will greatly reduce, obviously, reducing the bureaucracy, the overhead. And then getting into personal remote monitoring, this is a thing that we have actually already now so that you can test your blood pressure, you can, um, you know, your heart rate and various other things and your dialysis record, etc. It can now all be done online. You can do it from home or you can do it from a clinic near you in the, uh, in the main street or in the, you know, the corner store. And then, you know, going right the way around clockwise, uh, the, the latest idea is that you can actually have chips embedded in your body which will give a continuous readout to whoever's monitoring you in the hospital. 
so that if your heart misses a beat or if your blood pressure goes up or if your dialysis is not working properly, you don't have to dial in or check in online. You're just being monitored in a continuous way anyway. This will presumably keep people healthier, it will reduce the paperwork, and it will reduce the number of trips to the hospital, which brings us to the next way of trying to bend that curve down, which are the uh, um, trying to uh, distribute healthcare. So instead of having you know, big fancy new buildings which cost over $1,000 a square foot to build, you can devolve many of the activities which happen in today's big hospitals, including MGH and the Brigham and many of the hospitals here, you can devolve those out into neighborhood clinics, which may be in uh, organizations like CVS or Walgreens, or they may be just standalone uh, shacks like you see here, where you can get uh, taken care of for you know, checking up uh, you know, on your broken limb, checking up on your dialysis report, or you know, asking a question even, if uh, you feel like it. And then the last thing is actually uh, having your home wired uh, so that all these checkups can be done from home. So those are the, the view from the present of what the future will bring. This, this, is, this is what I call the near-term resolution of the cybernetic uh, revolution that has taken place within the healthcare field. And then just lastly, uh, in a reassuring way, there's a sort of wonderful example in Britain of what are called the Maggie Centers. So people who, um, women, who have had breast, uh, breast cancer or other forms of cancer, have a local neighborhood clinic to go to, not a big hospital, not a big unfriendly institutional place, but a home from home where you can meet people who've got the same condition, you can meet clinicians, you can get tested, etc., all in places which look a bit like this, all designed by star architects. So Richard Rogers Sturken Harbour, Frank Gehry, Zaha Hadid have all been enlisted to create a wonderful place in which cancer patients can come and get checked up by their doctors. So that's short term. We sort of, we know where we're going. It's within the headlights. It's, you know, we're driving within the beams. We can see what's ahead of us. But then there's the longer term. What is that next revolution that is going to take place? And, you know, what is, what is the unknown unknown out there, to put it in Donald Rumsfeld's way. Um, Bruce Mao, who is a, a celebrated designer in Canada, asks the question, now that we can do anything, what are we going to do? Um, and he quotes Arnold Toynbee, interestingly, because Arnold Toynbee wrote a 12-volume, that big, uh, study of history, um, which is world history, and it was published in the first half of the 20th century, considered to be the most erudite, most all-encompassing work, but he was a historian uh, whose view encompassed 5,000 years of human history all over the globe. And he quotes uh, Toynbee as saying, the 20th century, in the 20th century, we will go down as having addressed the major issues of humanity. But really, in the 21st century, I would sort of gauge that down a bit and say we may be remembered by future generations um, and come up with some ideas which are practical, i.e. not wholly utopian, but things which can be implemented. So I'm going to give you some teasers, this, this next series of slides, very quickly, it's some teasers about things that are definitely going wrong. It's asking the question, it's asking the question, how do we shorten the trip from China to Europe? How do we short the, shorten the trip from Australia to Europe, but in more global terms? European youth unemployment is hovering in, in Greece and Spain is over 50%. This is not an acute problem, it's a chronic problem. So you have people coming out of high school, you have people coming out of college who have no jobs. How do they enter the economy? How do they have a life? They've got 70 years ahead of them. And so what's the, what's the issue there? One problem. The next issue is 
the income disparities in the advanced industrial countries are growing and the income disparities between the advanced industrial countries and the developing nations are growing. And we get, along with those income disparities, we get huge social dysfunction. And there's a very interesting work called The Spirit Level by Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett, if you would want to look at some of these. Yeah, you can actually look at it online too, but it's a good book, um, which outlines all the social dysfunctions which can be correlated with these huge, social, uh, huge income inequalities. How are we going to deal with that? If we do deal with it, and let's say the countries that are a little bit behind catch up with us and everybody starts consuming at the rate of uh, the United States, let's say, we're going to need seven planets uh, to just sustain our level of living. At the moment, the United States uh, operates consuming four and a half times as much natural resource as we are replacing. The world in general is consuming about 1.3 times as much as we can replace. That is, we're run, uh, hospitals, just, just to let you know, on the left-hand side, are operating about 15 or 20 times the rate of replacement of natural resources. We can't go on like this. And just to zoom in on one little piece, meat consumption, the richer you get, you know, so let's say these poor countries catch up with the United States, they start eating more meat. And eating more meat means more um, carbon footprint, etc. And it means a, um, a greater increase in heart disease, and so on and so on. So there are all these things going on at the same time. With the greater carbon footprint, we get a rise in sea level. In the Spalding Hospital, and I won't go into the details here, we have tried to integrate into the basic design the notion that the sea level will rise by approximately two feet within the lifetime of this building, an 80-year 80 80 lifespan, by the year 2100, because it's on the Boston Harbor. Why do we put it on the Boston Harbor? Because hospitals belong in the city in terms of operating highly specialized medical care. And the picture on the lower left is a picture of a subway station, which is not how we want to envision the future. So the task that is set for us by some of these advocates of uh, uh, um, addressing climate change are there's a sort of famous one called contraction and convergence. In order to get the whole world down to this, the Advanced countries, like the United States and Europe, have to radically reduce their carbon footprint. Meanwhile, the developing countries, particularly China, India, Russia, Brazil, have, have to be allowed to develop, continue on the upward scale, and then come down. And then, by the year 2050, we should all be together on that downward trajectory. That's contraction and then convergence. The good news, well, the, first of all, the news, good or bad, is that urbanization is also happening. And you see this in China, in Europe, in India, all over the place. You see urbanization. And the good news is that cities are very efficient ways of doing our business. Uh, we actually use less carbon per person in cities than we do in the countryside. There's less driving around, there's, and you can't produce what you need to produce, and so on. So, in summary, let's, we got, in my, just my quick slice of this, we've got four problems which we need to address. We've got climate change and public health. We've got population growth, rapid urbanization, mass migration, growing inequalities. We've got high unemployment worldwide with, with low income, therefore low consumption, therefore nobody to sell our stuff to, whether we are China or the United States. We've got to, people have to have money to buy what we're selling. And the last thing is we have got this resource crisis. We don't have seven planets at our disposal. Uh, so how are we going to enjoy life on an empty tank? And the last word I give to an, a Dutch architect who basically says it is uh, us architects 
really have to start imagining. Rather than simply building buildings, we have to imagine what we're building these buildings for. What is it that we're trying to address with buildings? And you can read it from Jules Verne's 1886 vision of man landing on the moon to George Orwell's 1949 depiction of city-wide surveillance systems. What begins as a fantasy in the imagination of the creator later becomes the present reality as we see it. Shouldn't architects and urbanists be creating these fantasies and the realities? Shouldn't we be the ones who should be imagining how we're going to live in the future? Because it's how we're going to live that really matters. And maybe it's like that, but maybe you have another vision. That's it. Well, I guess I am just old enough to think that watching a baseball game while fishing is really, <laughs> that's a pretty good deal. Uh, <laughs> however, um, I think you can see why, I think as the students can see especially why I was so excited to have you here. We've talked so much um, with so many of our guests about uh, the, a specific design process or designing a specific thing. Um, and therefore, we were almost always talking about a fairly narrow world, you know, when we were talking about car design or talking about design of other things. It seems to me that um, in your case, we, we are focusing more than we have in any other, with any other guest on the question of kind of design, designers as leaders, as, as those who are shaping uh, the world for us. Um, how did you, um, I, I, you gave us some biography, but how did you get drawn to this? As long as I've known you, you have been very interested in this role for the designer. Yeah, um, it's what I call swimming upstream. And it's, it's going back to the issue of the Cuddy Suck. I have to say that my architectural education on day one was worth it, um, which is you have to ask the question, why am I doing this? What is the context in which I'm being asked to build a health clinic? What is the context in which I'm being asked to do public housing or a private mansion? What is the answer to the problem as posed by the client? And sometimes clients can say, you know, I want to expand my office. I want to build another 100,000 square feet or whatever it is. And if you ask the question, well, why are you doing this? You know, what is it you produce? How are you producing it? Um, have you looked at reorganizing your office? Have you looked at doing, another, doing your business another way? Do you really need to build 100,000 square feet? I don't think you need to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At which, you know, for an architect, it does you out of a job, but um, you know, you've got to be able to ask the question. Well, actually, one of the things, one of our previous guests, you may know, um, Jordan Goldstein heads the Washington, D.C. office of Gensler. And Gensler, probably more than any other architecture firm, has understood this not just for five years, but for 25 years, that their job is to be a strategic consultant. And so, in fact, they don't lose money when they talk you out of building the 100,000 square foot office because they have you uh, on retainer all the time for strategic advice on everything they that's do. That's right. You invite them back. Yeah. Uh, exactly. And I think that's, that's it's interesting. But aside from firms like Gensler, who, and, and looking more broadly, beyond just in the architectural world, who do you see who is, design, who, who is um, taking a leadership role in our society using design as kind of the, the design of the future as their, as, as their, you know, as their uh, well, technique or approach? I mean, the obvious one is Apple, you know, which produces, I mean, just in terms of physical objects, they produce just absolutely fabulous things, everything from the object itself to the ads uh, is superbly designed. But that is only a signifier for the thinking that goes behind it. So the notion of you know, having a, a telephone, a, um, a letter writing pad, a violin, and all those other things that go into an iPhone is really the brilliant thinking. But you can't show that. You can't show the brilliant thinking unless you have a superb physical design as its front page. You know, this is really interesting, though, and I'm, I'm so glad. I, how many of you in this class had heard of Charles Fourier before today, the French uh, utopian? 
I think it's great. I, first of all, in a way, I think that every college education should have an entire course on utopia, visions of the future, because they do provide the context for anyone to operate uh, in their own time. And I would say, I don't know these, most of these students individually, but this generation of students is actually deeply interested in social efficacy, which is interesting because I would say my generation, which, which followed the 60s generation, um, was reacting against it, <laughs> ironically. This is what we argue about all the time. <laughs> no, no, I'm recovered now. A, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I've recovered. But, this young man. <laughs> um, but, it, but it is interesting to ask the question, how does it, you know, we had, let me provide a little bit of context. We had one of my excellent colleagues, whom you may know, Dan Adams, mm -hmm. who does the work on um, adaptive reuse of industrial waterfronts. So just because it has an industrial use doesn't mean it can't also have a community use and it becomes both and rather than either or, which is very, very nice. Um, but so he's found a way in a market-driven world obsessed with individuality to incrementally improve uh, our, our, our prospective futures. Right. So I would say that Dan Adams belongs in that blue blob in the middle of the diagram. That I, you know, that is people who actually get things done in the real world, have to implement them, etc. But there are folks out of the blue circle, whether they're research scientists or um, the the contextual thinkers, um, to whom you have to pay attention. You know, otherwise the future comes at you from the left, as with the Suez Canal. And so let's take Buckminster Fuller, for example. You know, very famous guy. He produced all these fabulous things like Epcot and the Montreal Dome and so on and so on, the geodesic dome. They are completely useless, you know, totally useless enclosure of space. But uh, what he spawned just by this approach, this method of thinking, was very high performance building envelopes, lightweight building envelopes, which, could, which have high thermal efficiency, which are easily transportable, which can be prefabricated, etc. He wasn't responsible for actually inventing those things, but he was responsible for the mode of thinking which allowed these to be invented and implemented. Mm, mm. He's, he's, he's also uh, uh, the father of the space train, no? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which ended up being a much more like geometrically usable right. <laughs> enterprise than, yeah. than, than the dome. Yeah. Uh, well, um, you know, I think that I, I, there are so many things to talk about with regard to your talk. I mean, we can, I, one thing that, one observation that maybe is worth pointing out is that in the context of uh, uh, futurism and utopia, I have to say that our contemporary obsession with the term sustainability is put, setting the bar pretty low. But, I mean, I, I'm not saying it's not very hard to achieve, but it is, it, it's sort of at the bottom rung of the utopian uh, Food chain. What I mean is, our goal is simply to continue to exist, <laughs> not to not to achieve some sort of a, a ideal political structure, yeah. or not to have satisfy our our dietary needs in an idealized way, like the like the Kellogg well, characters. You know, I have to agree with you. I mean, just sustaining what we have <laughs> is not a very ambitious thing, and and the latest buzzword is resilience. Right. You know, right. and I, I'm sort of part of this movement which is even more conservative. I mean, you know, just sort of harden yourself up against whatever is coming is not the right approach. You have to invent your way out of it, you know, so that whatever's causing this thing, which you have to be resilient against, is what you have to address. It does beg the question, what would the charge be like as I, as I rallied the troops behind me to say, let's sustain ourselves, let's continue to exist? I mean, right. I suppose well, actually, it beats the alternative. There is a perfect example of this in the New York Times today. It was sort of too late for me to include as an illustration of what I would regard as, you know, boneheaded ingenuity, <laughs> um, which is uh, Verizon in New York is putting up a massive wall around its networked headquarters um, in the event of another Hurricane Sandy. And they can... Uh, just drop it in, uh, In takes them about two, th two or three days to assemble this thing. They're trying it out right now on the anniversary of Sandy. It's sort of mm. ironic. Um, I, I shouldn't call it boneheaded. I mean, you know, we live in the present. We can only do what we can do. It's a short-term expedient solution mm. to the problem of flooding their, their networks. 
but they got to be thinking hard about the entire future. So I would, you know, if I were, if the head of Verizon were in this room, I would say, well, let's look at Marconi's station, you know, which in 1903 was fabulous. You know, and we could get a crackling voice right across the, the Atlantic Ocean. And then see where we have gone in, actually, in the space of just a couple of decades, and then, you know, in 1960, the first satellites. You know, that's the way we've got to be thinking, so that those Marconi stations are no longer necessary. They're, they're wiped out. They're actually being eroded by the sea. Mm. Um, but we have another system altogether, and that's what Verizon should be thinking of. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the idea about um, that everybody, the idea of that as a, a prototypical solution to rising waters in New York does seem um, does seem a little bit. Well, it's anti-New York, is right. you know. I mean, New York loves access and you know mobility and mm -hmm. all these sort of modern ideas. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the, the, in the old days, uh, you know, we didn't make. Uh, well, we did make we did make walled houses. They were called palazzos, um, but m more often we made walled cities because right. there was a collective need to uh, repel were, the invader. They were, they were walled against human beings. Right. We right. got that problem too, but never right. Mind. right, right, right. Um, now, um, here's a here's an interesting question. Um, it seems that there are some eras that really produce um, surges in utopian thinking or futurism. And then others maybe where there is less. Let me just use some of the examples that you cited. Certainly in the latter part of the 19th century, there was an explosion of utopian thinking. Um, and, and, I, and you cite maybe one of the reasons which was the Industrial Revolution had, got, had made life so, uh, had sharpened the negatives of uh, lifestyle that had maybe been more similar in the past, and now some people really lived horrible lifestyles and therefore caused them to think, of, now this is really a problem. How we live is a problem, and we need to be thinking about this and foregrounding this as something that we need to solve. Yeah, so, you know, for instance, William Morris, who was a textile designer, furniture designer, um, who lived in the middle of the 19th century and was part of the British Arts and Crafts Movement, but very influential here in the United States as well. He was, you know, most of these utopians were socialists in a sort of soft, small s sort of way. Um, and his response was not to build a huge building with 1,620 men, women, and children in it, but to actually go back to what he regarded as the golden age of the Middle Ages, where you know, you could live in a small community that craft was highly um, valued and uh, people knew each other. And, you know, that there is still a lot of thinking like that. And I think that, you know, there is still that trace of thinking in the new urbanism. Even though I sort of um, really don't have much taste for the architecture, I do appreciate what the new urbanists are trying to achieve which is a sort of humanity about um, the way we build towns, the way we build cities. Uh, I, you know, I think to be, you know, the, the negative, the dystopians, the, the negative views are excellent as wake-up calls, but they're not very fruitful in terms of discussing, well, what do we do in the future? You know, they're not answering Bruce Mao, and they're not answering Winnie Maas, mm -hmm saying, you know, well, what do we do now? We've got to create something which is better than we have. But isn't what the dystopians are doing, actually, I, I would agree, actually, that it's, it's, it's in a way just as valuable. It's just a different part of the, um, the, the design food chain. It's articulating the problem and shining a light on and clarifying the problem that I may not realize exists. When George Orwell writes in 1948, about, I think it was 48. Uh, 49. 49. Um, uh, about a, uh, a, a, about a, a dystopian future, he's m maybe shining a light on that which even a moderately educated person might not have been able to see clearly at all uh, as as a potential outcome of some of political choices. Right. Well, uh, you, you've you've all heard the phrase "Big Brother is watching." You. That comes out of uh, George Orwell's 1984. And then, if you look at Minority Report, who's who's seen Minority Report, by the way? 
Yeah, it's a film, actually, which is really worth seeing, even as we're talking, as the government is being, you know, um, called into question regarding NSA surveillance of foreign leaders, but also of us. Uh, it has a lot of prescience about it. That's 2002. And Ed Snowden, you know, it is, it is not impossible to think that Ed Snowden, being the age that he is, saw Minority Report when he was a teenager and was informed by that view of life mm -hmm. given to him by Spielberg, who must have read 1984. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's that, you know, you've got to think about the, the lines of thinking which are carried on from one generation to the next. So, 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 there, so while the dystopians are not necessarily solving, proposing a solution, they are right. clarifying the problem, which is, I think we've determined in this class has been, is, I don't want to say 90% of design, but certainly it's, a, it's an enormous part of it. Um, being clear about, as we talked about even before we sat down, being clear about what problem is, it is you're trying to solve. And, and, if, and if you're not even aware of it, if we are like a client who doesn't, see the larger picture that we see because we've done, right. we've designed the built environment before. So, it, I mean, let's say, take an example. Um, the reason I advocate for the broader view um, is not, or, or while I advocate for the broader view, I do not discount in any way the narrower view. That is, we have to get buildings built, we have to get things designed, we have, you know, cars, whatever. We live in the present world. Mm. Uh, but if you are given an assignment to design something, it is really important for you to understand not only what is the question to which your design will be the answer, but it's really important to understand the context in which this is all happening. So where are the materials coming from? Who, you know, where is the labor force coming from? These are all actually important questions, as well as you know, what is this building for, or what is this vehicle for, or uh, and I think that the more you inform yourselves of that broader context, the brighter your new ideas will be. And then, you know, the, the packaging, such as, the, you know, the apple is a sort, of, a sort of common fallback. The apple is so consummately beautifully designed. But it wouldn't have existed as an object if they hadn't been asking themselves those broader questions about what can the telecommunications revolution bring to us and what is it that we can sell on a worldwide market what do the younger generation which is the biggest marketing demographic what do they want mm. and how does it feel in your hand well now this is really interesting because i think this um uh linking the issue of utopianism and futurism and so forth with actual design enterprises certainly in the healthcare world of course you do this. I mean, you, you, whether you, how, how successfully or unsuccessfully you do it is another issue, but certainly there is a kind of, there is a, a large objective in healthcare that is about wellness and a, sort of a broadly, a, a broadly positive future, and then there's a bunch of things that spring from that. But, you know, in the rest of, I, I'm, I'm just trying to square the uh, issue of thinking about the future designers as leaders with the reality that most utopias that we have looked at, and I think virtually all of the ones you cited, are to some extent about a collective enterprise, a shared enterprise. Um, in an age of real individualism, um, what, what you know, uh, we can talk about iPads and iPhones and we can try to imagine the future that Steve Jobs kind of had in mind that uh, to which these all these various products are simply bricks or for which they are all simply bricks but also the uh, people designers that you cited like like uh, Buckminster Fuller or Franklin Wright frankly or or uh, Archigram um, these are folks whose uh, it's it's hard to it, it seems hard to reconcile the visions of now, see, because Wright wasn't really extreme individualism, because of course he designed Broadacre City, and there was actually a community. Yep. So maybe things like Fuller and Archigram are better examples in the sense that, or maybe Fuller, with the freestanding house, the freestanding car, it's really designed for you and maybe your family to exist in an ecosystem that it does not imagine. Mm. Right. 
Yeah. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't prescribe a future in which these are but this is equipment. If we think about Rwanda, or if we think about Western China, or if we think about, you know, name your place, um, do these solutions apply? Or is there a different question mm -hmm. that we should be asking yeah. ourselves? So, for example, and I didn't show this because I don't yet know quite enough about it, but one of the interesting phenomena in Spain, which is one of the basket case economies of Europe, um, with all this high, the, the general unemployment is something around 26%, and as I said, you know, the youth unemployment is over 50%. Um, the two communities have actually done pretty well. Well, f first of all, I should say in a rural village, which I know pretty, pretty well, these statistics apparently do not apply. Everybody looks pretty prosperous, pretty, you know, fully engaged, and all the generations working with each other, etc. And it's largely because of a black economy. That is, it is an alternate universe, which does, <laughs> has as little contact with the government as possible. But they do it communally. Mm -hmm. so, like a barter system, you mean? Or? Well, yeah, people do stuff for each other. Mm -hmm. you know. um, and there are some more anecdotes from the 1930s in Austria, where you invent your own money system, which was closed down, of course, by the Austrian authorities, because it was subversive. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, there are two Spanish examples. One is in uh, Marina Leda, which is in Andalusia, which was a um, basically un under General Franco, who was the dictator up until 1975, the, all the olive groves and everything were owned by a single landlord. When Franco went, all the people who'd been working in these olive groves said, well, OK, he's gone. Now we're taking over this entire estate of olive groves. And they made themselves a cooperative. And the, de the deal is everybody shares the money, every, you know, all the income from the olives, everybody, uh, every young person who wants to stay in the town and wants to marry someone from wherever uh, has the right to a house, not at their expense, but it, and it belongs to the town, etc. They have done very well throughout this uh, recession. Um, the other one is in Basque Country, and I'm just blanking on the name for a second. But after World War II, a priest got everybody together from technical colleges and said, OK, we're going to just start things up on our own. And they now have a vast industrial complex, which is communally owned. And during the recession, as the sales went down, they decided not to fire anybody, but just to everybody take a reduction in weight in income, as a result of which everyone was kept in employment. Mm -hmm. And now that things are picking up again, everybody is still employed, and the next generation is doing fine, getting you know as the old ones retire. So there are different models uh, for doing these things, and it is addressing this big social ill, which is going to, I think, Europe is just a harbinger of things to come in the United States, where we already have you know, a vast number of unemployed people who do not have a future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, this is, this is the interesting thing. Um, I think for this class, for this group, um, how the skills at um, conceptualizing a problem, visualizing a problem, clarifying what the issues are, focusing one's energies on it, you know, we see how that's done. These folks have lots of examples in the for-profit world in this country on how that happens. What they don't see is the kind of, and what I think they are, frankly, many of my students anyway, are hungry to find, is a way to get engaged with these large issues that you're talking about, which are absolutely, it seems impossible to avoid, and you, uh, whether that, you know, big issues about, about, uh, about our, our energy use and, the, and their effect on the climate and about the economic viability of our, of our, of our nation's operations. I, I, who are the people who are really um, uh, thinking like designers about these issues? Right. I, I, but you know, you and Antonio de Mambro did 25 years ago yeah, uh, I mean, in, in, in response to a, a, a design competition that, uh, 
that also was in the year 2000, as I recall. Right. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, and Antonio, by the way, should get all the credit. I was simply part of the support team. It, so it's, just... a, it's, a, it's a cool and clever idea, which I'll, I'll post on our site. Uh, it's a solution to um, rising waters for Boston that wasn't drawn last year after Sandy, but was drawn 25 years ago and with full awareness that this was inevitable. Right. Um, by the way, Mondragon, if anybody wants to look it up online, M-O-N-D-R-A-G-O-N is the name of the town in the Basque country, which has been so very successful economically. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think that, you know, whatever we can, I mean, you'll find this in any sales department, you know, when the designers come up with, you know, the latest version of a vehicle or the latest version of um, an iPad of some description, um, the, the uh, marketing and sales department will say, well, who is this directed towards? Right. You know, what, is it, what are their needs, et cetera? Are you, you, know, are you, are you blue-skying things and nobody will see the point of it you know, for another 50 years? Or is this real? Right, right. Um, and I think that, you know, that's why I put in that little sort of excerpt from this Carlota Perez, because, you know, I, and I'm sure that, I, I have some queries about her, her theory, but it's, at least it's a structure to think about which roots you in capital investment in the new ideas. What is it we're going to invest in uh, which will take root and we may have a crisis as it goes along, um, but you know, in a rational ironing out of all the problems, is this where our future lies? Does it lie with solar energy? Does it lie with um, the desalinization of water? Does it lie in uh, us all just getting out of the cities and going back to the country? The, the economic or, or the demographic indicators suggest that actually we're better off collectively if we live in cities. So a designer, an urbanist, a planner, you know, is better informed with that type of information to work on so that you say, okay, well, if we live in cities, just like you know, these guys in the 19th century were trying to say, well, cities are all very well, but you, know, you get jobs, you live close to each other, you have all sorts of economies of scale, and now we say your carbon footprint is lower. But you know, not everybody likes living in cities, the inequalities are awful. How do we address, you know, in design terms, how do we design the future so that the cities are as great as that guy watching television while he's fishing. Right, right. Well, you know, the, the issue about, uh, uh, as we know very well, one of the challenges in, in reimagining how people live is that there are so many sunk costs in the way that you already do things. Cities actually are remarkably, you know, the sort of traditional uh, American cities, especially that really came of age in the 19th century, are actually more malleable than a lot of other types. The, mm -hmm. the problem, as we know, our, our colleague uh, Ellen Dunham Jones has written so well about this. Retrofitting suburbia is is a really complicated design problem. When you, if we're going to talk about imagining how we live, um, uh, most of these, most of our students probably grew up in a suburban setting of one kind or another. Um, and if you imagine the single-use, you know, suburbs that we, we know the taxonomy of this very well, right. and and the ownership patterns and all the obstacles to reimagining those in not let's say not utopian but slightly less dystopian uh, fashion when it comes to energy use and, and the like, that is I mean aside from you know the the, the new urbanists, Ellen Dunham Jones, a few other characters I don't know if you saw the uh, the MoMA show called Foreclosure a no, few yeah. years ago. Very depressing in, in, in the poverty of, of, of interesting thought on these actual issues that need solving. Uh, right. Uh, it, was, it was in response to the economic collapse, uh, in, in the housing collapse in 2008, looking for more sustainable housing patterns. So the question is, you know, let's, let, let's take a couple of examples. Um, and following on from that train of thought, is it smarter to own a house or to rent it? You know, which is the more satisfactory economic model? Mm. Is it, you know, because at the moment, government subsidizes homeowners to own their houses. Significantly. Yeah, yeah significantly. 
I mean, it's a ta you get tax relief on the interest paid on your mortgage. And so that pushes a certain line of thinking. And if you own your house, you make a certain set of decisions. If you rent your house, you make another set of decisions about how you want to live, where you want to live, what you spend your money on, etc. So the big question is, how do we live? And under what economic model, personal economic model, do we live? Another question, which you could ask the same thing about, um, and actually this was a question we asked in a recent housing project that I was involved in, um, was a you know, huge requirement for parking in the housing. Now, this housing was supposed to be zero carbon, low energy, this, that, and the other, and just as sustainable as you could possibly get. And so the question that actually I posed to the team is, are we going to give a bonus to those people who will not own a car, but will give them availability for renting? You know, the obvious thing is zip car. Mm -hmm. The second most obvious thing is the collapsible sort of shopping cart type of car, which comes out of the MIT Media Lab. And would you, uh, for instance, um, have a car provided for you just as the way you have a refrigerator provided when you buy your house? Right, right, right. Or will you have transportation provided for you? Right. And then in a development we did in Harvard Square, we did exactly that. We said, because there was no space for parking, we just made a part of the deal. It's, you know, it's kind of minuscule, but a, a no-brainer that anybody who buys an apartment in this complex gets a free zip car for, you know, as long as they're there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this is, the, by the way, that guy is Kent Larson at the MIT Media yeah. Lab, and he was one of our earlier guests. And I, I'm so glad you mentioned it because really, I would say, in our market-driven world, um, and he would give us several caveats to this, mm. uh, but he is kind of the closest thing that I can think of to a utopianist or futurist yeah. for our time, mm -hmm. because he is doing, he's dealing with the reality of, uh, you know, he's not, his, his ideas do not presume massive political revolution. <laughs> right. They do not presume uh, utter transformation of the context. They say, look, um, this so called sharing economy that, you know, has been on the cover story of several magazines and really is now hitting its stride where the lives that you and I have led are of owning things, owning your lawnmower, owning your car, owning your house, owning all these things, even if you don't really, I mean, some of them you use more than others, um, but the idea that almost all of these things could be part of the sharing economy, that in fact I would have my card and I'd have the, the mower for the day or I'd have uh, something so, else like this and it's not but it, it's not based on a Fourier kind of model it's right, based right. on a it's based on a, 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 a information rich ecosystem that allows all this to happen so what is interesting okay I'm gonna ask you all a question so if the proposition is put to you that your car if you have a car would you um, join a car sharing club where anybody who signs up can use your car at a you know designated it's all coordinated by computer would you be happy for someone else to drive your car? No. Well, it wouldn't matter except for the insurance aspect. Okay. No, no, all that's taken care of. All the technical details taken care of. But you don't mind somebody using your car well, for the show. Well, but I think, I think what, 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 um, what Kent implies is we wouldn't even be having this conversation. That's a transitional conversation. Yeah. So, I would definitely mind, even though I've got a ratty old car, you know, I don't want anybody else driving because they're going to screw it up in some way. <laughs> and this is a reaction of my generation. I feel it's a sincere and genuine reaction, <laughs> it's rational, but uh, the, de the demographic surveys suggest that people in your generation actually don't have a problem. Well, and, and if they, what if they don't own the car in the first place, they just use Zipcar, or they, they don't, they use, they share a car right. that they, for which they do, they, that that layer of emotional attachment has been peeled away. Right. Oh, look, this time, I'm, I, this time I'm using an Audi. Next time I'm using a Toyota. Yeah. I, you know. So the general point, I think, is that it's not just, a, when you're thinking about the future, it's not just a technical issue, there's a cultural issue, which is why I put those sort of two axes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. up on the screen. And, you know, it's all very well to invent something new like Buckminster Fuller, but 
you know, nobody's, apart from a few crazies, are going to live in a geodesic dome. I mean, it's just not a hospitable space. In fact, um, I'm, a, I'm going to hope that nobody's parents here live in a geodesic <laughs> dome. But, and I'm going to assume that, just a working assumption. And I would recommend, if, you, if somebody you're thinking about dating lives in a geodesic dome, take a step back, think it over. Okay. <laughs> um, how about uh, questions from the audience? Do you have any questions about this? Fabulous topic. Please. I'm wondering, um, Get a little closer now. <laughs> no, no, actually, we, we need to get it for. Uh, there we go. For you, it is more related to where on the scale do you find yourself and your role in determining. Um, what's happening? Are you more of a research scientist with seeing, telling us where this is going, where the trends are that, that we need to solve? Or are you actually involved in finding solutions that can uh, be used to implement some of the things for, say, climate change or rising waters? So in that big circle with the two cross axes, I would be on the right hand at 3 o'clock on that clock. You know, I'm, you know, I think you can tell. I'm a sort of contextualist. I'm, I'm trained as an architect. I am... I used to have my own practice, but I'm now fully embedded in a client, a large client organization. And my job actually is to be a good client by asking the sort of questions that we're discussing right now. Right. So that we are a smarter client so that we can get our architects right. and designers thinking the way we're thinking about, say, healthcare or whatever. But Hubert is underselling him. He's also a very accomplished architect. So he'd be both on the at three o'clock and at the center. I would say. Yeah. Um, I actually had a, a follow-up question too. Um, you mentioned some of those, you know, the smaller villages, the circumstances where more of a social structure was able to kind of weather the tides and, and to do that. And it seems that 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 structure seems to work on a very small scale, where people are invested in one another and they know each other, and everybody can see the benefit of well, if I help him out, I see directly on my daily life how that helps me. But then it seems to break down in a larger scale or a larger context. Do you feel that the new trend towards, say, social networks and you know the global information age, a lot of people are worried that that's pulling people farther apart. They're not actually interacting. But on the other side, it could be linking people together. It's providing an empathy to a section of the world or a whole community you never knew before. Do you think that it has the potential to bring that to a larger scale where you actually feel that, that empathy for other people? That yeah. You have? And let me give you an example of this. Um, as a hospital system, Partners Healthcare is one of the founding members of something called the Healthier Hospitals Initiative. And it's, uh, the founding members were six, six large systems throughout the country, which included Kaiser Permanente, is probably the most famous, the MedStar in Baltimore, Advocate in Chicago, the Hospital Corporation of America, which is the biggest for-profit hospital organization here, a couple of others, uh, Kaiser Permanente, and Dignity Health in California. Um, and we meet once a year, and you know, after five years, we now sort of know each other. Um, uh, but otherwise, we just communicate electronically, and we built up a big movement for you know energy reduction, waste reduction, you know, reduction of toxins, etc. In the system, we're doing very well. This is going global. So, for instance, I was recently in Spain, and I made contact physical face contact with the Andalusian hospital system, which is private public organization. Had some people in the room, told them what we were doing. They told us what we were doing, they were doing. And now we've got them hooked up with Argentina, Costa Rica, and various other Spanish speaking countries. It's a sort of global thing. And having made that initial contact, you know, People, you know, it's a question of establishing, I guess, a trust or a, an understanding of how somebody thinks, and you can get something global going. I think you, it has to be sort of fairly project-oriented to work, I think just on a social level. Actually, I have a daughter who's a journalist who's all over the place in real bad places like Yemen and Afghanistan, and God knows where else. Her community is a a virtual community of journalists who are doing similar stuff and who can advise on, you know, which is a good hotel to stay in or a place to dust down in for the night and which is unreliable, who are the translators, who are, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the minders, etc. So that works. Yeah, you know, I think, I, I, let me 
offer another slight spin because I think, I, if I understand your question, it's really more about, uh, I mean, certainly it, it, it is true that, these, that there are multiple kinds of networks in addition to a kind of traditional village as a way to, you know, uh, uh, create relationships. I certainly, I think, yes, it is much easier and more likely to create groups of people online and develop affinities and, and empathy, a word we've used a lot this term. Um, uh, it's much more powerful, frankly, than I would have guessed if you'd told me at the onset of the social network movement that, that you could create a group of friends that are widely disparate and don't have an obvious project-based affinity, like we're all doing something specific together, but just have an interest in something. You know what? I think actually, in my, at least in my experience, I think that that is increasingly possible. Um, and, and now, it, but, but to get back to the real genesis of your point, which is that, you know, yes, there are high levels of social um, agreement that can be arrived at when people have a lot in common. You know, they're all related or they all live in the same town or whatever. And, and I think it has been shown, certainly, um, that one of the complexities that, United, that we face in the United States, and by the way, uh, it probably in Brazil as well, because it's an extremely diverse country, um, and less so in a lot of other countries, is, is getting a, a sense that there's a, a you know, the, the big exception here is Canada, which is very diverse, but has a much stronger sense of cohesion. And I, don't, I can't explain that necessarily. But it, I, I think there is some correlation between how diverse a place is, therefore how many obstacles there are to the ease of feeling like you're all part of one enterprise versus more homogeneous places. I mean, I think that's just a reality. I think I've, I've seen social science data on this that's, that, that that's true. It doesn't mean it can't be overcome, but it is, I think, it is a challenge um, that we have multiple things that we're trying to do at the same time, um, bring people ever greater diversity together, and then get them to act in common interest. I think those are, they're not like falling off a log. I, I see what you're saying, but I, I would say, you know, sort of tentatively yes, but if you look back at the sort of Carlotta Perez model, I would say that it's not a financial crisis, but it's a, a cultural crisis that we have, which is trying to establish a mores, a, a mode of behavior on the network. Mm -hmm. You know, because the dysfunctionality of the network is well known to all of us. I mean, the, the levels of criticism mm -hmm. and, and the bullying that happens and the misinformation that happens and the fact that, you know, you can't ever believe everything you read online because there is no editorial filter, what sure. we were talking about. Sure. So I would say that this is, you know, it's going to be a 10 or 20 year period of actually trying to figure out how we live within one another, the way we live in our neighborhoods, you know, according each other respect and understanding our commonality, uh, it has yet to be established in the virtual world. Mm -hmm. right. Right. It's, it's Other questions? Okay. Well, Hubert, I want to thank you very much. <laughs>